Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Midtown Scholar Bookstore. My name is Alex and I'm with The Scholar. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're happy you're here. We hope you feel safe and we hope you enjoy tonight's program. Uh, before we begin, some quick housekeeping notes as always. We have many events coming up in the next few weeks, including appearances from Hannah Witten, Rebecca Searle, Kate Baer, Matthew Desmond, and many more. Please take an events flyer with you as you leave. They're up at the front table. Stay tuned to our social media and newsletter, and we hope to see you at a future event. Uh, two, we encourage you to come away with a copy of Sister Maiden Monster and get it signed after the conversation this evening. Book sales are the bedrock of sustainability for these free author events, and every purchase helps support the author and the bookstore. But now I'm happy to introduce our speakers here this evening. Tara Stillians Whitehead is a multi genre writer, filmmaker, and professor. She is the author of Blood Histories, The Year of the Monster, and They More Than Burned, which is officially coming out next week. Her writing has appeared in dozens of magazines and journals, including Fairy Tale Review, Cream City Review, Prism International, and The Rupture. Her work was selected for the Wig Leaf Top 50 in 2021 and 2022, and has received various nominations for Best of the Net, Best Small Fictions, and the Pushcart Prize. Of course, our featured author this evening is Lucy A. Snyder. Lucy is the five-time Bram Stoker award-winning and Shirley Jackson award-nominated author of 15 books and over 100 published short stories. Her most recent titles are the collections Halloween Season, Exposed Nerves, and Sister Maiden Monster. She lives near Columbus, Ohio. Of course, the book we are here for this evening is titled Sister Maiden Monster. Uh, I have to read just two quick blurbs. This one's from Sarah Langan, who writes, quote, Sister Maiden Monster is the feminist Cronenberg I didn't know I needed gleeful, gory, and unrelenting. And Lee Murray writes, quote, a mutant hybrid of weird science and cosmic horror, Sister Maiden Monster is deliciously cerebral and unflinchingly feminist. Violently beautiful, this novel is a tale for our times, end quote. We're honored to welcome Lucy to the bookstore for the first time. So without further ado, please join me in giving a warm Harrisburg welcome to Lucy and Tara. Hi, welcome everybody. He said to talk close into the microphone, so I'm just doing what I was told. Okay. So I just met Lucy a little while ago and got to talk to her. Um, do you want to introduce who is right here okay. between us? Uh, this the is special guest. This is Squishy, the uh, non-spoilery but completely thematically appropriate octopus. I've been taking Squishy around with me and uh, just, you know, for fun. <laughs> <laughs> He is very delightful. Um, was really he's well kind of staring at me right now. And uh, uh -huh. I think he's challenging me to get into some good questions for you. <laughs> so um, I have to just start off by saying I absolutely love the book. Um, I've never read anything like this before, and I'm going to try really hard not to create any spoilers. So I'm going to start with some general questions. Okay. And the first being with five Bram Stoker awards in everything from poetry to short stories to nonfiction, obviously you've mastered myriad incarnations of the horror genre. So what do you think makes good horror? Um, and what is central the central binding ingredient in your special brand of horror, something that connects all of your work? Well, I think that one of the important things to remember about horror is that it's the literature of fear. And so engaging with the reader's emotions is really critical. Um, you know, uh, there, there have certainly been some successful horror writers who basically, you know, just have a gore fest mm -hmm. uh, where they're just relying on a visceral disgust. And I mean, there's there's some of that in there. There's a lot of it. Uh, yeah. A little. Uh, in, a good, <laughs> I in a good way, like not downplaying it. <laughs> Fair. Uh, <laughs> So uh, to my eye, uh, horror and romance share that in common that, you know, you really have to connect with your character's emotions to connect with the reader's emotions and really bring them along for the ride. And so characterization is really critical, you know, having well-rounded characters who, you know, can feel and think and do all those good things. Uh, because if you can't engage your reader with the emotions of what your characters are, you know, undergoing, it's very hard. And going off of that, you have three central characters mm -hmm. in this book, all women, all powerful in different ways. Um, I'm somebody who looks a lot at structure and when I'm, when I'm reading and just as a writer, and that was something that I felt was really compelling and different about the book was starting off with Aaron mm -hmm. and then moving on to um, Savannah and then moving on to Mariva. 
Can you talk a little bit about how you, you know, in developing those characters, how do you separate them in developing them? Like, cause they're not similar and they serve specific purposes mm-hmm. in being different. How was it to move from one voice to the next voice? Well, uh, some of that comes from the origins of the novel. The novel is originally based upon a short story that I wrote that did very well called Magdala Amygdala. Uh, you can read that for free. Um, it's online at Nightmare Magazine. Uh, but um, I wrote that, gosh, probably 10 years ago, maybe maybe longer. Um, it ended up winning the Bram Stoker Award, and it's been my most frequently uh, reprinted short story. And a lot of people had said, hey, are you going to do anything else in that world? Because that was, we really enjoyed that. And I thought, well, you know, uh, I'd like to. Um, And then some years later, I ended up writing uh, another, not a sequel, but another story in that world called My Knowing Glance. Mm -hmm. Uh, Magdala Magdala featured Aaron as the protagonist and My Knowing Glance was Savannah. And Mm -hmm. so when Nightfire said, hey, we would really like to see an expansion of Magdala Magdala. I thought, well, I have these two short stories and the logical thing to do is to kind of expand them both and see where they might interconnect. Mm -hmm. And then the third protagonist in the novel is Mareva. And uh, she came about as as a result of my kind of looking at where Aaron and Savannah would overlap. Now, where does that need to go in terms of the plot? Okay. Yeah, because Aaron and Savannah have, like they're they're on different sides of the spectrum, just personality-wise and they're, objectives and their dramatic needs and mm-hmm. whatnot so um can you talk a little bit about working with Nightfire, um the imprint of tour and sure. how they came to you and what that process was like um i ended up working with them as a result of uh my new agent i'm with uh, new leaf literary and that was kind of a kind of a fun story um i'd had an agent previously who basically the uh, the agency imploded after the primary agent unfortunately died oh, no. and her junior agent was had been friends with her for for decades and just kind of couldn't continue after a certain point. And so I had to go looking for another agent. And if you, do we have any writers in the audience? Couple, okay. Getting an agent is extremely helpful, but it's extremely difficult. Um, In the middle part uh, between novels, I was basically selling all my books on my own because, you know, I would approach agents, they'd say, hey, you know, your stuff is cool, but I'm not really, connecting with it enough to market it. So, you know, good luck elsewhere. Um, I had happened to go to a very, very small convention run by Maurice Broadus, and he introduced me to his agent. And she, I think, as a result of, you know, being friends with Maurice and kind of believing in him, agreed to take me on as a client. And then shortly thereafter, um, she just quit the business entirely. And, you know, to have lost two agents is sort of like, you know, you've been climbing up this snowy mountain and then suddenly the rope breaks and you're just in free fall. And I was panicking. Um, But one thing led to another and the actual president of the agency ended up picking me up. Oh, wow. And she made the connections and and got the ball rolling and got my work into Kelly Lonesome's hands. She's my editor at, at Tour Nightfire. And so things have gone very well since then. But it, it was kind of like, you know, you're you're climbing this mountain, trying to get to this lodge that you believe is at the top. You fall, you get stuck in an avalanche, and then it it somehow deposits you safely right where you wanted to go. And you're like, how did that even happen? It was it was not a thing I expected. Kind of had to trust the process. Yeah. <laughs> what so. Sisyphean <laughs> process that it felt like. Um Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad we got to talk a little bit about Nightfire because I didn't really know that imprint so much. Yeah. I go tour. Well, and... I can talk about them actually, like, cause I've c- talked around them. Yeah. If you could talk about them uh, specifically, yeah. that'd be awesome. Um, Nightfire has been really, really great to work with. Uh, by far the best uh, press that I've worked with, big or small. Um, it, I had previously been with Random House and imprint of Random House Del Rey. And at all times, I was aware that I was this really tiny cog in this vast machine, and mm-hmm. they didn't have that much time for me. I only ever worked with my editor there, and when my first editor got fired, um, and you're losing people <laughs> left and right, Lucy. Uh, yeah, it was it was it was kind of uh, it it was kind of alarming. And they assigned me to uh, an editor who was very good, nice lady, but she was a romance editor. 
Oh, not oh. really feeling my stuff. Uh, <laughs> she means like an entire yeah. other half. Yeah. Of the genre. And, <laughs> and, and I, I think they just looked at what I was writing uh, genre wise and said, urban fantasy, that's like romance sticker over here, where in fact, what I was writing was supernatural horror in a strappy black dress. So <laughs> it was not a real good match there. Uh, but she suffered through, she, you know, got my trilogy finished out. But um, yeah, that was that was not the best experience. And so I was kind of expecting that going into Nightfire. But like the day my book came out, everybody at Nightfire sent me a personal email oh. just congratulating me. And I was like, what? This never happened at, at Random House. And so it's just been very cool. Like I know everybody who's worked on my book, everybody has listened to me. They've they've asked for my input. You know, I've I've been as much a part of the process as I've really wanted to be. And that's something that I only really thought happened with small presses. Mm -hmm. You know, I certainly wasn't expecting it, you know, from an imprint of Macmillan. So, yeah. Being a, the part of the, did you have any, any input into this amazing cover? Of this I did. Book? Um, it's awesome. The cover of uh, the artwork anyway, oh, was this. done by a, an Italian duo that um, does work under the name Welder Wings. You can find them on Instagram. And uh, my editor had run their work past me said hey we're thinking about approaching these folks to see if they'll do the cover and I went to their insta and looked around I was like yeah this looks really cool they do this really neat um hyper realistic weird art and uh so she was like what do you want to tell them in terms of direction I'm like honestly I don't know like let's <laughs> just see what they come up with you know based on what they know about the book and they came up with um an image that was very similar to this. And then I gave them some, some suggestions about other kind of imagery to add, um, like the, uh, the, the crucifix that's in there. Mm -hmm. um, I deliberately had them make it uh, kind of non-standard uh, mm -hmm. because of reasons that will, would be spoilers. Right, <laughs> we're gonna try and talk around those spoilers. Yeah, so, <laughs> so they worked a lot of cool stuff into the cover. And I also, it, it's a really eye-catching cover. And also I think it successfully gives people kind of a heads up that, you know, yeah, if you're looking for a nice sapphic romance, this is probably <laughs> not what you're looking for. There's going to be some stuff happening in this. I mean, maybe the first 10 pages, but like, <laughs> yeah, but past that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause as I was reading the book, the, I haven't had this experience where the cover was kind of revealing the story to me. Mm -hmm. So as I was reading through, I'm like, Oh, now I see what this means with right. the cover and this significance. So it felt like the cover evolved, which was just so amazing. And also I know that Midtown Scholar posted on the Instagram page that this was their cover winner of the year. So, nice. um, but yeah, so I'm so glad that your experience with Nightfire was what you wanted it to be and that the yeah. process with them was what it was. Um, I want to get into talking about the book specifically. Okay. Um, I think the question we could use to get into talking about the book without again without spoilers is I think it you tackle a lot in terms of political gender and religious commentary and you do all of this using a feminist lens so Alex read the blurbs I mean at the end of the day no matter what you see in terms of um the violence and the sex and the gore like I could still see the feminist lens everything was being framed that way um can you talk a little bit about how you were able to frame so much? And actually, let me just take a step back with the rest of this question. This is a pandemic novel, mm -hmm. you know, set in the future and it references coronavirus. And I feel like you were able to, this is what I mean by encapsulating so much commentary. You were able to like critique what we're going through now and what we've been going through in terms of the government um, and in terms of just the individualism, et cetera, how were you able to do all of that without it feeling, and I don't know if you can even explain this without it feeling heavy handed. Like, did you, did you ever feel like, man, I'm trying so hard to address all of these things. Um, how did you trust yourself and what was your process, I guess? And that's a really loaded question, but yeah. if you um, could 
get something out of that and kind of drive it. Maybe we could go in that direction. I mean, I'm sure that somebody who's not on board with what the characters have to say is going to think it's heavy handed. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. I, that's going to be eye of the beholder stuff, but um, I'm glad you think that I, I handled oh, yeah, it. Going into death. the tavern and the, no, oh, yeah, no, yeah. what is it? No face diapers. on. The- yeah. It's just, <laughs> I've seen so much of that in Ohio. Mm-hmm. I figured that once she's out of the city, she would be encountering that type of thing, even though all of this terrible stuff is obviously happening. Um, a lot of it was, I wrote this when the pandemic was, you know, in the worst of it. And um, I hadn't honestly expected Nightfire to ask for this particular book because, you know, the standard wisdom that we've been hearing at um, conventions and that editors were saying was like, ah, we have a pandemic going on. Nobody wants to see pandemic fiction. Just don't even think about it. Don't do it. And so I had given my agent several book ideas um, and said, you know what, I mean, obviously Magdala Migdal is on the table, but I don't think they're going to go for it. And they were like, no, this one. And I'm like, really now? Cool. Okay. Um, We'll we'll work with that. Um, And it was actually in some regards, very helpful to be writing it in the middle of the actual pandemic, because there were aspects of the original story um, that needed to be updated and needed, needed to be adjusted because there's one thing to think about, okay, how would people react during a pandemic versus looking out in the world and seeing, oh, this is very different. I need to account for that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what I really enjoyed about the the balancing act Mm -hmm. that you were doing was on the one hand, there was obviously a massive amount of research that went into how the brain works, Mm -hmm. um, how viruses work, this specific virus. I'm trying to remember what it is. P what is the PVG. acronym PVG, um, which is an encephala, what yeah, is it? It's it's- polymorphic viral um, gastroencephalitis. Yes. So it affects your brain and, and your innards and your innards. Um, and so that's where like, I, I liked how the body horror met science there, mm-hmm. but then y- you, um, you also have from the, I don't know, the balance for you is just this, the science and the gore. And then the passion and, um, the queer love stories that were going on. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could talk about, um, how you were able to, or how you go about integrating, you know, the, the science and the virology, and then like the more bestial, like visceral sexual elements. Um, did you do those in two separate Like, did you sit down when you wrote and you're like, okay, today is a research day and I'm working on, you know, Mm -hmm. the science and I have these people that I saw that you wrote in your acknowledgements and here's where I'm going to work on the virology stuff. And today I'm going to work on the sex stuff and the, you know, and the love story, or did they all happen organically? It it all (laughs) happened kind of organically. It's all of a piece. My personal background is I have a bachelor's degree in biology. Mm -hmm. So I've been kind of a, a science nerd for a really long time. Um, I originally intended to go into a PhD program, but for a variety of reasons that didn't happen. And I ended up going into uh, science writing in the first round of graduate school and and things kind of went from there. But I've always been interested in science and I've always kind of tried to keep up with things. Um, And I've always been fascinated with viruses and uh, systems and things like that. If If you've studied biology, there's a lot of sex in biology. I mean, everything is about evolution and reproduction. Uh, and there's, if you have done a biology degree, there's also a lot of really gross stuff that happens. I mean, there's the laboratory dissections, but it goes, you know, well beyond that. Um, and so I, I feel like there's a lot of body horror just like baked into the actual experience of doing biology that, you know, of course gets sanitized in the papers and people are just like, well, we're not going to talk about that part, but it, it's always there, you know, um, And so for a lot of the book, I just kind of leaned into what I kind of already knew. And then I approached the subject matter experts later for making sure that I gotten it as right as I could. I mean, Mm -hmm. obviously at a certain point, the science is going to break down because uh, the book goes into the supernatural. Um, But I had a really great conversation with one of uh, one of the folks that I, uh, I talked to for like hours and he had some great suggestions. And so on that revision pass, I did go back and, you know, changing some things specifically to kind of incorporate more of what he had suggested. And so that was the only pass I can think of where it was just like, okay, I'm just working on the virology. The rest of it was all of a piece. Mm -hmm. So 
Yeah. Cause I, when I was reading it, I was just thinking about the way the characters were talking about the evolution of the virus sciences and how much of that had come from what had been discovered during the coronavirus pandemic mm -hmm. and how much of it was just that it wasn't becoming popular knowledge until the coronavirus pandemic. Um, but you're talking about the supernatural and kind of skirted the sex question a little bit, but we'll get to that. Okay. Um, <laughs> And so when did you decide, I think we need to go supernatural now? Like, was it from the beginning, like you had the concept of like this virus was going to have, I, I can't give any spoilers, but the, the virus was going to then lead to a supernatural cosmic yeah. horror type of yeah, that narrative. Was, that was always going to be where it was going to go just because of how Magdala Amygdala uh, turned out plot wise. Mm -hmm. um, that was, that was always the target. Uh, so I knew that that was, uh, that was going to be there. Um, and I just had to figure out how to make it as realistic as possible until we kind of got to the turning point. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, not to be too spoilery, but I also wanted to make sure that the book can be interpreted in a variety of ways that you could either take what the characters are experiencing at face, face value and think, okay, these people are experiencing the things that they're witnessing. Mm -hmm but you can interpret it alternatively which most people haven't been they've just been taking it at face value but you don't have to you mm -hmm. know you could you could view all of the protagonists as being deeply unreliable narrators so yeah i kind of felt though yeah <laughs> um and going back to talking about the protagonists then i feel like the first section of the book with the protagonist aaron sets up so much in terms of these it sets up a lot of expectations that I think are intentionally thwarted later on. Mm -hmm. Um, but Aaron specifically, like you made the decision that Aaron, as she gets infected, we can at least say that she gets yeah. infected. Like once she gets infected, um, it happens in the very first, yeah, it happens yeah. in the very first 10 pages after, after the, the sapphic love stories, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, starts get, getting rolling. Um, once she becomes, if I, what I found was interesting, cause this is in the beginning too, mm -hmm. is she talks about how her husband, well, her, sorry, her fiance Gregory infects her with HPV. Mm -hmm. Um, and she talks about like the massive physical consequences of that. And I felt like, well, A, the, the way you wrote about that was refreshing because it wasn't nuanced. It wasn't, you weren't using euphemisms. It was just like, he infected me and this was horrible. And then she gets infected with something else. And mm -hmm. all, like every subsequent infection or something, which she was in a way breaking from the, uh, the, the narrative she'd written for herself or that she had let society write for herself. But one of the dominant narratives was about her, her sexuality mm -hmm. um, and why it wasn't working with this nice man who had infected her with HPV. Yeah. I, I'm probably putting more emphasis on that than I should. Um, and so I was wondering if you, you know, with that, like how, uh, why was that necessary for you as a writer to have the queer element come in at the beginning like that. Um, and was that always, was that, I don't, I didn't read the short story, so I don't know if that yeah. was already a part of Aaron's narrative or not. Yeah. Betty was always a part of Aaron's narrative okay. uh, because of a certain scene that happens again to avoid spoilers, the scene in the hotel. Oh that, man, that, that seems really, really intense. That, that, Im uh, that impacted a lot of people. Um, and a lot of people were marked on that. So I'm like, well, obviously I need to keep that for the expansion. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that, that, that's a, that's an important scene. So I needed to keep Betty in there. Um, I, the reason for the queer aspects, um, I was, it's complicated, like, but I just decided that it would be an interesting story to have this woman who, you know, has been trying to fit in these roles that, um, you know, her family and society have kind of put out there for her. And she starts out trying to do the right thing. And then she gets infected with um, the polymorphic virus and everything is taken away from her. And in the process of losing everything, she no longer she increasingly doesn't have anything to lose. And so she starts, you know, exploring, expressing those parts of herself that previously she was like, no, 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 I can't do that. That's not appropriate. That's mm -hmm. not what, what I'm expected to do. I'm expected to find a nice guy and settle down. I'm not supposed to, 
you know, be making out with a stranger in a junkyard, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of a spoiler, yes. but you know, well, you have to talk about some of the specifics, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I was noticing that, you know, as someone who I've taught monster literature and the monster is always a metaphor and something that Jeffrey Jerome Cohen, who has a book called monster theory, because monster theory is now an area of study is he says the monster always escapes because it lives in the hybrid spaces and it can't be defined. And I, and I think that's like my, that was my, I don't want to say struggle, but there's like this inclination to, when you're reading something to want to just like, Oh, okay. So now they're monsters and now Mm -hmm. they've lost their human form. Um, but you consistently remind the reader of the humanity of the monsters, Mm -hmm. even when you get to a point later on in the book where one of the characters is described in a way as still being human with Mm -hmm. their white hair, Mm -hmm. you know, um, and some being more human than others too, because not all of the monsters are treated equally. Like just because you're a monster doesn't mean you've broken free of societal constraints and, Mm -hmm. you know, like there, there's like this strat, you know, the stratification of, of the monster. And, um, so what I, what I liked was that like you were saying with the book, you can, at the surface level, you can take just the plot level characters and what they're experiencing. And, um, that keeps your butt in the seat with the, with the book, but then at the metaphorical level of, you know, the monster is often the human, the true monster. If we look Mm -hmm. at Frankenstein, you know, Frankenstein's monster, Dr. Frankenstein was truly the monster and abandoning his child. And, um, you know, so I I think what I found interesting and complex, and I don't even know if there's a question in this somewhere, (laughs) um, was how the evolution of the virus and the way that the people who become infected with the virus, how they became, for me anyway, as a reader, commentary about society and it's all taking place in this apocalypse. Right. And Mm -hmm. so I think like, I guess my question here is, you know, where do you go from here (laughs) and Uh, (laughs) where, where, where's the next step from this? Uh, like in terms of a sequel, is there a sequel? Cause I I sensed at the very end, no spoilers. I was like, there's probably a sequel to this. Yeah. It, it kind of depends, I guess on, you know, again, how, how does the book do? I mean, we can't get away from you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the pressures on publishing. Uh, so, I mean, that's a conversation I'm going to have with Kelly at some point. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there's But in your of, heart, in your writer heart, what do you feel? You know, I, there are a bunch of different directions I could take this, um, mm-hmm. and I haven't quite settled on one. Uh, but I was thinking, for instance, this is a for instance, I'm not necessarily married to this idea. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about uh, doing a sequel that focuses on uh, some of the male characters. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously Darius has a story that's mm-hmm. going on. Obviously, Dr. Sallow was into some things that are pretty interesting that yeah. we never really get to see. Was he the this... TV personality? Uh, Dr. One... Sallow was the uh, the psychiatrist at Greenlawn. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I was thinking of the TV personality that gets interviewed on Dr. Katz's show. Oh, Bruce Takahiro. Yeah. Yeah. The Australian yeah. guy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Did she read it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's, he's another character that, that could have another story. And then there's, uh, there's the barista at the, uh, the roadhouse, um, with the, the injured hand, you know, mm-hmm. there's lots of people that I could focus on for the next, next one. A lot of people love Savannah. I could, you know, focus on a narrative that's just about her and about her journey, you know, Mareva, what is it about obviously. Savannah? I mean, I, I get it, but like, what do you think in talking to people gets them really interested in Savannah? If she stands out of these three women, She's, I'm hearing somebody over here yeah. telling us what <laughs> <laughs> everybody loves everybody a good psychopath. Like yeah. A psycho uh, with a nice fashion sense. Yeah. Right. So yeah, Savannah, um, I tried to, even though she goes pretty far off the rails, uh, I try to keep some important elements of humanity. Like she is capable of empathy. Um, She's mostly choosing not to engage it, which is what makes her evil. Like she's making decisions that, you know, she knows what the correct, the right thing to do is, Mm -hmm. and she's chosen to do something else. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's excusing it as, well, I'm just doing my job. And how much evil in the world have we seen where people have said, well, I'm just doing my job. 
what did you expect? It's like, well, do the right thing, you know. And her job in a lot of the book involves m- m- murder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and she whistles while she works. She so. and she does. Yep. She was kind of she's not a sociopath, but she's the closest to a sociopath. Yeah. I think of of all of the characters. Right. And it was a shift from reading Aaron mm-hmm. because her she's the first section in about 150 pages, I think, mm-hmm. with Aaron who you're like deep in this narrative. And suddenly it was like with Savannah. And I kind of like this because I like when stuff gets disrupted. I switched and I thought, oh, here's another woman. Oh my God, who is this woman? <laughs> um, talking about Dahmer, <laughs> relating to Dahmer, um, you know, and just, she's a serial killer. Mm-hmm. And, and it was like, it was, I, I think the juxtaposition, obviously with the chronology, it works with the book, but the juxtaposition to coming from Aaron was, it raised a lot of questions for me yeah. as a reader and it kept me wanting to read through and go, okay, w- when is this going to come together? And I'm going to see, you know, the purpose, the, the ultimate purpose with these women here. Yeah. And then we get Mariva, Mariva and it all kind of starts to come together. So, um, yeah, I intentionally wanted the novel to be n- not perfectly linear. You know, there's a lot of switching back and forth in Aaron's section because she wants, she's infected starts having a really uh, wobbly association with time. Mm -hmm. She doesn't really know when the past and present is. Um, She starts losing chunks of memory as, as, as time goes along. Um, And so her section has a very deliberate, you know, shift to present tense. Was hers the shift in the, I had noted that and I said, I want to ask her about this shift to present tense. Every, every character, when there's a shift to present tense, they've been infected. Okay. It's gone into their brain at that point. And so they're experiencing things more immediately. Um, So uh, no spoiler, but you can, you can see that happening in Mareva's part and also in another part in a flashback or, or a recollection that Aaron's having early on. Um, So yeah, that was that was very deliberate. And I, you know, when I was sitting down to think about what am I going to do with these two short stories, I could attempt to write a braided novel that's like more traditional, yeah. where you have the characters and you switch you in know, chapters from, like, yeah, here's the Aaron chapter. Now here's the Savannah chapter. And yeah, and I could have done that. Um, and I chose not to because I was thinking about, you know, the the whole experience of getting sick for me has always been massive disruption. It's like I've been going along. It seems like I've always gotten like a bad cold when I've just gotten a workout routine down. Like mm-hmm. I'm going to the gym regularly. It's all good. I've got a project going and then I'm sick and I'm in bed and everything's different and everything sucks. And so I, I kind of intentionally introduced those abrupt shifts because that's that's what this kind of thing does in your life. They also feel like escalation. So something that I didn't find in, in your book, which was good, was the saggy middle. There was no mm-hmm. saggy middle. Because we have Savannah. <laughs> because we have Savannah. And Savannah's sort of like, like you're driving the speed limit and then you realize like you're, cause you're from Texas. Mm-hmm. Like in, t- I don't, is it the same in Texas now where like at night there's no speed limit in certain areas? I don't know. Okay. I cause when there. I drove through Texas a million years ago, it was like, 70 in the day and the night there was no speed limit. So Savannah's like going into nighttime in Texas and it's just like, and then Mariva's like, we're not even driving anymore. We're sort of on a spaceship. Okay. And that's not a spoiler. There's no, yeah. so, <laughs> um, yeah, let me see if I might have one. I want to make sure I ask. The, I want to make sure that everybody in here gets to ask some questions too. Oh, the one other question I did want to ask you about, and I had talked to you was about your use of humor. Because in dealing with all of these, and I hate to say commentaries, but these themes, these topics of a pandemic and um, political, political, social, cultural turmoil, you still maintained humor. And a lot of it comes out in the character dialogue. And I thought, like, is this, was that just to create levity? I mean, obviously it creates mm-hmm. character, but is this your default? Do you, do you? feel that does your hor- does does your writing usually include humor it frequently does not always i mean i have written some uh some short fiction that's absolutely grim dark absolutely serious top to bottom but i feel that you need um shifts in fiction you know if everything is doom 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 and more doom it's you're just like hammering your reader and they become kind of numb to what's happening 
So I, I think you need to mix it up a little bit. And uh, humor is a good way of, you know, building the character, but also uh, kind of breaking things up a little bit. Um, and in terms of building character, it's showing a level of resilience that the characters have that, you know, even though things are horrible, they can still find humor in the situation. You know, often it's kind of an exasperated type of, I cannot believe, you know, what's happening in my day type of humor. There's but... rain in my hair. Where did that come from? <laughs> yes. It's like, I was just thinking of like Savannah where she's right. Savannah is extremely funny, which makes me uncomfortable because she's also sociopath and I'm finding this, but it's like the Dexter that like you think about yeah. the show Dexter where people love that show because, you know, because of who Dexter is as a character or how yeah. he's characterized. It's like, wait, but at the end of the day, he kills people. Yes. So is the problem me? Am I the monster or yeah, <laughs> maybe probably it's um, it's one of those things that you have to be a little careful of. You don't want to mm -hmm. have the type of humor in a piece that's going to sabotage the mood you're trying to build. That's, that's going to, going to sap the energy and the stakes from the situation you know, you don't want to have a character, like, even though Savannah's can be flippant, she is taking things seriously. There's not a point at which she's not taking her role seriously. You know, when Mareva starts to try to take things into her own hands, mm -hmm. like Savannah's taking that seriously. She's, mm -hmm. she's pretty upset about it. So, um, Mareva, she does her job. She does her job. Yeah. Um, so Savannah can, you know, sort of wisecrack, but it's not in a way that she, that indicates that she doesn't care about what's happening. She still cares, mm -hmm. um, not in a, a healthy way, but. <laughs> oh, definitely not in a healthy way. <laughs> well, I wanted to make sure, cause I know I was keeping an eye on time. Um, we have a microphone over here with the wonderful Alex. If anybody in the room or online has quite, oh, has questions, looks like. Um, yeah, so feel free to raise your hand if you have a question and I'll come around with a mic. So when you started writing, was it always horror for you or did you start in a different genre and shift to horror or was this always the plan? Uh, yeah, I originally, when I was a teenager, I read science fiction and fantasy and that's what I wanted to write. You know, I was, you know, big into Lord of the Rings and, uh, you know, uh, Anne McCaffrey's Pern series and a lot of other things like that's what I really admired. Uh, the problem was that my entire life I've had chronic nightmares. Uh, really vivid, really off the rails nightmares. Um, and they would kind of be stuck in my memory. Like, un unlike a lot of people I know, I do tend to remember what I've dreamed. And I, I would try to write something, you know, happy go lucky about elves. And then it would always kind of take a turn. And, uh, you know, I had uh, early on, I remember a boyfriend saying, why can't you write anything nice? And I'm like, well, <laughs> I guess I can. Guy. Yeah, I did. Uh, <laughs> uh, but in my, in my twenties, I finally kind of pulled up my socks and said, okay, clearly I'm writing horror. I need to like, you know, get myself up to speed and start actually reading horror. And I hadn't previously, uh, I, I didn't watch horror movies or anything when I was a teenager because it would make the dream so much worse. Right. You know, it would just really amplify things. Uh, and there was a period when I first started reading where that had kind of a negative impact, but anymore it doesn't uh it, it's relatively fine uh but yeah so so in my 20s i started acknowledging what i was doing and uh trying to be specifically better at that rather than trying to pretend oh it, it i'm writing something else because to a certain extent uh you know somebody had given me uh, neil gaiman's sandman comics to read and they presented it as fantasy and it is but there's also a lot of really really dark material in there so you know I had run into people in science fiction and fantasy uh, readership community who managed to claim horror novels as something else, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, they would say, oh, this is a really cool fantasy. It's a little dark, but, you know, um, like I'd been reading Ray Bradbury all along and his stuff is can get super, super dark, very horrific, but he wasn't presented to me as a horror writer, you know, mm -hmm. so. Do you ever feel like you get, sorry, if somebody else probably had a question, but do you ever feel like you get presented as something that you're not like in a box or somebody tries to put you in this box or this box or. Um, yeah, that happens kind of all the time. I, I, for a while was, uh, a, 
an adjunct instructor in the uh, Seton Hill MFA program. Mm -hmm. And um, the director, who shall remain nameless at this point, uh, was remarking on, you know, uh, the fact that I was, I was, you know, just, you know, I was a horror yeah, writer. Right. Not, not, not really just, but, you know, saying, oh, well, you're getting all the horror students. And I'm like, I, I, I also write fantasy. And they're like blinking at me. And I'm like, I have an entire fantasy trilogy right over here. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, have, have you forgotten what I had on my resume when you hired me? <laughs> it's like the discounting of genre yeah. and everything that falls into genre. If it's yes, God yeah. forbid, romance, sci-fi, fantasy, yeah, anything, then it's not serious literature. Right. But we like it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, I have run into that, that people tend to think of you as like one thing mm -hmm. and it, it, it can be anything, you know, it's however that person perceives you and then you're, you're that, and there's a tendency to view you as nothing else. But it sounds like you moved into what you needed to be, as opposed to what you thought you were going to be like, once you got over the nightmare stuff. Anyway. Yeah. Um, I mean, lemons into lemonade, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, obviously the nightmares were not going to go away. I might as well, you know, mine the heck out of them. Your characters have nightmares in the book too. You were talking about like leaving the PhD program that reminded me of one of the, like, you're talking and I'm seeing the yeah. characters in you, which is obvious, but I, I do put myself, at least my experiences into all of my characters. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I also make completely make things up as well. So any, oh, yeah. any given piece of my fiction is going to be a mix of the deeply personal and the completely made up. And hopefully when the dust is settled, like you can't tell the difference, mm -hmm. but I mean, I'll cop to it if somebody asks me. Yeah. I like it though. Any other questions? Do you eat sushi? I do. And would it shock you to know that after reading this, it's going to be a while before I eat sushi again? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel okay. like I'm taking something something lovely away from you. Yeah, I eat sushi. I'm not a fan of the octopus sushi for um, texture reasons, but uh, <laughs> this is why. This is why. Yeah. Squishy. Um, I have a question. Um, I mentioned the Cronenberg uh, blurb from someone mm -hmm. and I recently watched Crimes of the Future which was very disturbing have you seen it I have not yet okay I was going to ask you to explain it to me because I have <laughs> no idea what happened um, well, give me your email and when I watch it we can we full can synopsis yeah yeah um uh I guess well the transition to that is are you influenced by Cronenberg or any other like in the in the film genre any body horror that influenced this work or maybe your other works or I guess more broadly in horror films have they influenced your work at all um i can't say no i can't say yes like i wasn't specifically thinking of cronenberg when i when i wrote this but i certainly do like his work i haven't seen his entire you know catalog uh but the movies of cronenberg's that i've seen i've i've admired quite a lot um if anything the the movie i have kind of a weird thing that i do like when i'm writing something or preparing to write something i'll often get fixed on a particular um a particular piece uh and the one for this one that i'd been you know kind of watching a lot in advance was annihilation um and i don't know that there's necessarily all that much in common and i don't know if it influenced it but it was like tickling the parts of my brain that i felt like you know needed a little extra nudging any other questions you have nothing so when you were writing the psychopathic character, mm -hmm. what was your process in writing a character that's fun to read the mindset of, but also drawing the line so we know that they're the bad guy, that we're not supposed to root for them? Well, part of it is that Savannah legitimately, um, early on, you, we don't see it later because we're not inside her head. She is on a level kind of struggling with what she's doing. Maybe not struggling super hard, but like there's, there's a part of herself that's going, you know, this is wrong you really know this is wrong. Um, you know, uh, the scene with Allegra, uh, the final scene with Allegra, you can interpret that in a variety of ways, but like she clearly knows what she's supposed to be doing. And, and she clearly also knows that she's making this decision not to. She's not fully deluding herself. Um, so, you know, she's got, that, she's got that tension in her. Like there's a part of her that still does wanna do the right thing but she's having a really good time not doing the right thing. So she's selfish enough to not want to give that up. 
And in a way she's doing her job still, which I think the struggle between her inside and then what she's being told to do in order to get the information that she needs to get. Right. Um, the people that she's, I won't say anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So she does end up spending some justifications for herself, but she's, she's complicated. Mm -hmm. She's complicated, but she's also very confident and she's very strong. She has a lot of very good qualities that have been, you know, uh, that are being employed to ill purpose, mm -hmm. but there's a lot about her to admire. And then there's, you know, the whole psychopath thing. So <laughs> well, in her backstory, like what made you put her backstory in there about her, her dad? That was part, uh, that was the big part of the original. The original. Story. Okay. Yeah. So it was like her finding out about, you know, what following your nature actually means. And then, you know, we kind of, oops, sorry, kind of went from there. Um, but I wanted to keep that in there because it, I think it was important to understand that for this character, she's driven by anger, mm -hmm. you know, as much as by hedonism mm -hmm. that, that she has so much anger in her that, that she can barely keep a lid on. And that's why she's become such a violent person, you know. We have time for maybe one more question from the audience. Anyone? So, oh. Um, I found it really interesting how you mentioned uh, that you had studied biology previously. Mm -hmm. And this is my first book of yours that I've ever read or any work at all. Um, and yeah, I felt like the biology aspect in it and all the science and that was very organic organic part of the book it didn't feel like it was placed in there so it really makes sense to me now in hindsight knowing that you came from that background but not reading any of your other works did you incorporate your previous you know biology are there little snippets of that in your other works uh, or? definitely there's I, I tend to it having a background like that kind of informs how you see the world um like any other you know profession would you know uh a cinematographer is going to see the world very differently than somebody who hasn't had that background and hasn't watched a lot of movies. So, um, so yeah, the, the biological fundamentally in, it informs how I see the world. You know, the if you've ever had a microbiology class, that really impacts how much you wash your hands. You'll just be like, "What did I touch? What could be on my fingers now? I better go wash them." You know, uh, and people who haven't had that experience don't understand it you know, at all. So, uh, so yeah, a lot of that kind of stuck permanently and, uh, and it, yeah, it just, it just affects the kind of stories I think of. And, you know, I, I did kind of cheat by having three nerds as, you know, viewpoint characters, but I felt like we kind of needed to keep that in there so that we could have a little bit more, uh, commentary about what was happening and that they could comprehend what they were seeing on YouTube and that type of thing. We give Lucy and Tara one more round of applause. Thank you. Uh, congratulations, Bye. Lucy. Thank uh, you. Uh, I, uh, I was talking uh, with a colleague earlier, and Tara mentioned it, but really, I've been a bookseller for like seven years now. The most badass cover I've ever seen it's so good. is that book. Uh, really incredible. I'm a, I'm a fan of buying books, even if you don't have time to read them. And I urge everybody in here to buy this book and at least just put it somewhere where you can see it because it's so pretty, and then eventually read it. <laughs> but definitely read it but i'm just saying not during buy your, your buy it for your friends even if they don't like it so but like, don't read it during your lunch hour i discourage that yeah <laughs> not during yeah, breakfast not when you're eating sushi no, um, <laughs> no sushi <laughs> we're gonna have a book signing over at that table with lucy book sales or books are available for purchase up at the cafe we also have uh tara's books up there as well um so thanks again for coming out everyone have a good night Alex. thanks everybody thanks for organizing